It is the rainiest day ever. I'm going down to Wales again, to North Wales, actually to the place where wildling sailing first started, and that's Bangor. We first bought a eight meter manhole there in Dickie's boatyard there, and I'm going there now to see Sailing Melody, who have recently purchased a new boat, and they are selling their steel boat, which I'm sure a lot of you will already know. But if you don't know, Sally Melody bought this wreck of a steel boat and they've essentially salvaged it. They've spent thousands and thousands of pounds and man hours getting this thing almost ready for the water. So Andy's hinted at giving me a really, really good price for this boat. We're going to go check it out and then we'll talk some money a little bit later on. Well, I'm here. It's so funny being back here in this yard. Still some boats that were here three years ago are still here. Had a little moat around and I can't find uh, Melody. Such an interesting place, this banger. Very down to earth. Yoshi is just moaning. What are you doing in your little hoodie? You wanna go out there? You sure? for a change. I tell you what, it is nasty, nasty out here. I'm gonna go sit in the car flipping. I tell you what though, Melody's looking a lot better than she was a year ago. It's been a year since I visited Melody and since then a lot of welding, a lot of work's been done. She's looking very clean. She's a little, a little more sleek than I remember her being actually. I always thought she was quite a chunky lady and she is. Not as chunky as I thought. So you've actually got some pretty decent cheap boats here actually. Just come to the office to look in the window. Bit of window shopping. You've got a Westerly Centaur for 4,500. You've got this 27 footer, three grand. You've got some 30 footers, 44 footer, it's a bit expensive. That's a bit expensive. 11,000 for a Newbridge 25 footer. 28 footer there for 10K. Westerly GK 29 for 9,500. Colvick Salty Dog 27, four and a half. Not all of them great deals, but some of them, some really good deals. All right, so yes. Andy, take it away. Yeah, horrible day, but anyway, this is uh, our John Teal 36 steel pilot house. Uh, she was ashore for a long time before we took over a, a couple of years ago, and we've done a lot of work. I'll very quickly run through, because it's horrible. We've replaced the whole of the front end, more or less, from the front bulkhead forwards, uh, with all brand new steel, welded both sides. We've got a brand new bowsprit tube, and stainless bowsprit platform with the anchor roller. The bottom of the keel has been fully replaced with 8mm steel um, with a very, very thick 8mm steel plate and a 100mm up band all the way round. So that's all been done, rock solid. At the back end, the whole of the lazarettes were all completely rotten as well. So we've chopped out this enormous area. All the welding below the waterline has been done by Danny, who's a professional marine coded welder. The prop has been balanced and polished by Castle Marine. The cutlass bearing is all brand new in, a bron in the original bronze housing, but the bearing is new. It's detached at the moment because I need to put several more coats of epoxy primer on the plate. And the keel, as you notice, she's a triple keel. So she's got a full length long keel and bilge keels so she can take to ground. So she doesn't need a cradle and she can sit on the beach. But on the floor here is the swing keel. And this goes up inside the long keel. With the keel up, she draws three foot nine, and with the keel down, she draws about eight foot. It pivots on a big pin here, sits on these blocks in the down position, and then there's a big, crazy big winch inside to winch this up and down. Now, this has actually got a ton of ballast, lead ballast in the keel itself, so you, you can't move it. It's, it's not just a centerboard, it's a proper keel. Let's go up on deck and uh, have a quick look at the top sides, and then we'll get indoors. Try not to get blown off. Coming up onto the back deck, the bathing platform was originally plywood, so we've replaced all of that with solid steel. Uh, needs lots more coats of paint, but that's just paint and, uh, and sanding. And I've got a better hatch to go in there. We've got this temporary hatch on at the moment, uh, but I've got a nice one which I'll put on once all the steel work's been done. I completely rebuilt the whole cockpit itself. 
It did have opening lockers. There are no opening lockers in the cockpit now. So if you take a big wave into the cockpit, there's no water gonna get into the boat. And I put stainless steel channel in the transom so you can put washboards in. So you can either have it as an open transom, a walkthrough or with boards in. So I've rebuilt the seat and all the cockpit combings and the whole cockpit floor. The steering system is at home at the moment being refurbed. Deck gear wise, she's got a pair of Lumar 53 three speeds, a pair of, sorry, Harkin 53 three speeds, a pair of Lumar 30s, uh, a little gib one, that's just for the uh, roller reefing. And then on the coach roof, she's got a Lumar self-tailor for the uh, in-haul and out-haul for the in-mast furling and for the topping lift or whatever else you want to put on. And the, the main sheet track is on the, on the pilot house there. We'll go forwards quickly. One of the things that I'm in the process of doing at the moment is changing all the chain plates. They were all mild steel and they were rotten, so um, we're welding on brand new stainless steel chain plates which actually go right down inside the hull, um, but they're, they're much stronger than they actually need to be. So she's got new nav lights as well with new fittings, a new gooseneck by the mast for the mast wiring. Over the next few weeks, what I need to do is several more coats of epoxy primer and then the final top coat. On the top of the pilot house, we've got uh, currently one sun power 110 watt solar panel uh, with the proper deck fitting uh, and that's powering uh, the leisure batteries at the moment so that's keeping it nicely topped up and provides plenty of power but there's loads more room up here to put as more solar panels than you'd ever really need oh, jesus christ <laughs> let's go inside it's horrible <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness, that's brutal. That is so bad. One thing that I'm noticing, the boat's not moving at all. <laughs> no, blowing like, like this yeah, proper yeah. storm force. It's got to be storm force. It's yeah, got to be 50, yeah. 50 mile an hour wind out there. It's really howling. The boat doesn't move. There's loads of bits for this boat which are not on the boats. Things like the grab rails, the wind system, the you know stuff for which we're going to put on when we finish the painting. If we had good weather, there's a couple of weeks of flatting back the primer, uh, doing a, an extra bit of primer in a few places. Uh, I think there's probably two small patches of welding to do, which are not going to take long. And then it's just a case of painting in the final colour or the final, you know, and putting your, um, your grip paint on. The other thing is uh, welding in the last of the chain plates. So there's two for the backstay and two for the, the, the shrouds, of course, and then, and then the one for the baby stay at the front. She's got roller reefing on the Genoa, in-mast furling, uh, which has all been serviced and is working fine, and then a hank-on inner staysail with a storm jib, which is in perfect unused condition. In here in the pilot house, the teak veneers are generally good. Uh, they've got a little bit of sun bleaching here and there and could benefit from a bit of a rub down and uh, we oil them and stuff, but it would be nice to kind of get in there with the wire wool and scrape the surface. You can't really sand veneer. We've got a Plastimo Neptune gimbal cooker. I've got a new thermocouple, got a microwave, got the LG 65 litre fridge, which is brilliant. It's 12 volt only and draws very very little twin sinks so um don't worry they weren't blown noses they were just uh, cleaning camera lenses <laughs> so twin sinks with a pressurized water system hot and cold that runs off a calorifier which is heated by either the engine or the ever water heater so the ever on this doesn't blow air it heats the water and then that provides hot air coming out of your fans, which we've got one in the pilot house and one in the saloon. We've built all of this kind of uh, cabinetry in here because it was a very different layout when we got the boat. It was like a dinette kind of type affair. We've made it so that we've got these great big lockers here. We've got a properly big chart table uh, with a helm position in the pilot house as well. You've got your throttle and gears over here. Uh, and your helm position and there's a windscreen wiper motor unit which goes in there so you can be here on a day like today battering through great big waves and a big Ford Lehman tractor engine so she will cope yeah. with all of that. There's a drip of water coming through the a hole for the uh, oh, it's, yeah, it's, come, it's come through from the uh, where the uh, windscreen wipers go. Going from left to right you've got the controller for the air dispatcher you've got the boat's nautical miles 6753 you've got your bilge pump switches we've got a BM1 battery monitor, which is currently telling us we've got 80% charge, 192 hours. We're drawing 1.6, 1.7 amps at the minute, mm. and that's just charging from the solar. Then you've got your engine control panel here and your fridge on and off. Yeah, if you want it. In fact, 
There you go, the fridge is now on. Engine hours 1788. Bear in mind the boat was built in 1981, that's not a lot that's of engine hours for the age yet. Yeah. I can't show you the engine running because we're not in the water and there isn't, there's plenty of water about, but none going through the engine. Temperature's good, oil pressure's good, RPMs are good. She's got a brand new alternator on, great expense. And then you've got your, your normal sort of lighting, spreader light, steaming light, nav lights, you know, GPS instruments. Yeah, this PP means positive pressure for the domestic and then positive pressure for the toilet, for the loo. VHF, saloon lights and so on. And we've of course upgraded all of the lighting, it was all incandescent bulbs, so it's all now LEDs. Uh, and we've, the way we've done the headlining, it's, it's um, closed cell insulation, which is all removable so you can get behind it to do maintenance. It means that these panels are actually, you take the screws out of the battens and the panels are held up with Velcro, so if you do need to get to any of the wiring for these lights, it's a couple of screws, pull the panel down with a piece of Velcro and it's all very easy to get out. One of the issues that we had with the boat when we got her was that she needed work doing, fine, but all the panels had been glued and pinned. So to get the panels down, we, we were having to rip them off the wall. Like if you had to take this off, you'd, have, you'd be getting a crowbar and ripping it off. There are mm. places on the boat where I ripped a panel off to inspect the steel, destroying the wooden panel and then realised I didn't need to, it was fine. The original design, as I said earlier, had got steps coming down here, a bulkhead here, just, wood, just wooden, just plywood. So this is the actual framework of the boat. And uh, lazarettes in the aft, in, you know, lockers in the cockpit, which is great, really, really handy. But I've done away with those. It would be very easy to put a locker lid back in one of those seats. For ocean passages, I just like the idea of having a cockpit, which doesn't matter what happens, you're not getting any water coming in through any locker lids. These steps are temporary, by the way. Those are the proper steps, which will go on when all the dirty work is done. But yeah. Very swanky. Yes, very nice. So what, what I've done is I've um, opened the whole of the back end out, which is actually more consistent with the original design. The mm. original design had got a double bed widthways across here. What we've done is I've put a single on this side. It's actually, you know, it's almost a three quarter. No, it is a single. Um, but a single on this side and then left the other side um, as a, a, a lazarette. So you can just chuck your fenders in, throw them in, lob them in down the side down there. The stern gland and everything is also under the floor there, but we don't need to see the packing gland, I don't think. No. <laughs> that's the back end at the moment. Gas bottle arrangement, by the way, I'll say now, that's not a permanent thing. That's very dangerous and I'm very bad. <laughs> you can tell me off in the comments, but uh, that gas bottle will be living outside. Obviously it's plumbed in. There is actually a pipe already there. To chuck it in but I've just got it there to put the kettle on today I don't normally run it like that so yeah so that's the back end and again this all have the LED lights put up we've got all of that stuff just need just need to arrange it and then uh, what I was planning to do is just put a single bulkhead straight down the middle to separate the bedroom from the fender locker as, mm. it, as it were right right what? 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 <laughs> Yes, saloon. We've got a big table with two leaves that come up, which bolts onto the mast compression post. So there's a big compression post that goes between the mast itself. We need to actually cut a aperture in the ceiling there, and it bolts down onto the keelson, which is the keel box lid, which I'll show you in a minute. Great big uh, U-berth here, or L-shaped berth, and a single on the other side. Really nice teak opening cupboards on this side with a shelf. Again, we've upgraded everything to LED bulbs, so they're all minimal draw. One thing I really like about this boat, I'll just show you, is lee boards. If you're on passage and you're sleeping in here, whoever's on watch can be in the pilot house, and then you just move these boards forward and you've got instantly really nice, decent size berths on both sides so you can sleep either side depending on what tack you're on which I think is a big bonus and you actually feel really comfortable in there there's been times when it's been freezing cold and I've been sleeping on the boat and what I've done is put the lee boards to the outside and then got a blanket and bulldog clips onto the shelf and onto the lee cloth and it's like being in a little, a little tent yeah the batteries are under that seat there and the ele there's an electrical panel behind there. In here is the winch for the, uh, that's the back of the steering for the um, helm, and there's, this is the winch for the keel. You put the winch handle in the side here, and then that, it's obviously it's all disconnected at the minute, but that, that's how you winch your keel up and down. Mm. And the keel pivots on this. There's a great big stainless steel pin, 
uh, and this is the cap that goes on the end of it. The threaded bar were all kind of rusty. There's one of the old ones, they're horrible. So I've had brand new ones of those made up by an engineering shop. They're a very strange thread uh, and I've bought some taps so that when I go to replace that, the theory is that I can heat these old ones up, the two left in the keel, and I can remove them, withdraw them and put the new pins in. And of course, the reality of that is that the first time I put any torque on one of them, it'll shear off and I'll spend the next five or six hours swearing and drilling the bolt out and trying to get the bits of thread out from it. Uh, Panelling wise, we've kind of had mixed ideas. We started off with this idea of uh, painted plywood panelling hardwood ply and then just a mahogany window frame surround and it kind of we kind of like it but then I got irritable one day and tongue and groove the ceiling and it goes up so quickly and I think it looks really really cool I've got to finish the window frames but I don't know that's up to whoever has her whether to finish go with this idea painted ply or go with TNG TNG is just so quick isn't it mm. really really fast to put up and it's really cheap and pine is actually really sappy, so it's good on a boat. It doesn't um, it doesn't suffer as much as you'd think. You'd think it would be a bad idea, but it isn't. Moving forwards, uh, under the floor here is our holding tank. Uh, you can't really see into it, but that's the, the um, grey water tank where all the shower sludge goes. And when we bought the boat, uh, the boat had been laid up with the grey water tank full. So over the years, condensation, moisture, rainwater had got in and the grey water tank had overflowed. Uh, when it, so much so it got a crust on the top and when we broke the crust, the smell was ungodly. We were <laughs> running from the boat heaving. The head uh, I stripped out because I was worried about the fact that that water had gone up underneath the shower tray and may have affected the steel. And there is one small area there which I would be, I would feel better if I had the chance to just replace that patch. But that's the heads and all the heads furniture and stuff. Um, when I say heads furniture, that we've got a new Jabsco C toilet to go in there and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you're wondering about the lino on the floor, I've just put that down as a draft excluder while we're working on the boat and it actually looks really cool. <laughs> Cheap and cheerful, but it just means that when you're on the boat um, and staying here overnight or working, it's a little bit nicer to walk on and it cuts out some of the drafts coming up through the keel box which is currently open. Uh, for peak we've changed the layout of this a little bit the original layout I've got a bulkhead here but I won't go into too much detail there. You'll notice on that front bulkhead I've ripped all of the wood off because I wanted to make sure that that bulkhead wasn't damaged or rusty in any way and I kicked myself because there is literally nothing wrong with it the steel is in perfect shape that's just the original silver paint and black paint and the the, the shapes you can see are just the glue that we use to glue this teak, pl teak plywood on. Again, we've upgraded all this to LED lights and we've got LED goosenecks, which I can show you in a bit. That goes with the boat if, if you want it. I bought it to put the instruments on in the cockpit and then I installed it and then I thought, it's just ugly. It's come off as you know, I don't know. You might like it, but I don't know. I just thought it was a bit ugly. Uh, that's the original steering wheel which goes on the steering system which is currently at home being refurbished. Uh, it all works. Our friend Nigel has rebuilt the gearbox, the Whit uh, Whitlock gearbox and it works perfectly but now it's been rebuilt and we know it's functioning. I've got it at home because I want to just um, tidy it up, pretty it up and make it look like a, a new thing before I put it back on. I'll quickly show you this. It's a very complex and uh, something we could do with, could do a whole episode on this. This is the lid for the keel box. That big plate is where the mass compression post sit. So that's just ridiculous. Everything on this boat is ridiculously over-engineered. Uh, but she's not as heavy as you'd think. She's about 12 tonnes. And that's the keel box. And it's just a case of cleaning up the surfaces. And uh, you can see it's brand new steel. The whole keel, keel box has all been done. How does that kind of like seal? I don't understand. These three lids. Yeah. and you sicker flex the crap out of it yeah. and bolt it all down with loads and loads and loads of nuts and bolts. In fact, it wasn't even sicker flex when we took it apart, it was butyl. Right. Okay. It was literally just more butyl than you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. It was tightened up, obviously they trimmed off the butyl that squidged out around the edge, mm. but there was so much butyl like squidged out around the inside, it was quite comical. So the, the, the keel sits like with this, uh, this cuppy thing, that cuppy thing sits over that pin and then in the down position, the keel sits on those two blocks. 
and in the up position obviously it's held up by the cable. Melissa and I got the keel out ourselves we just uh, had the boat lifted in the straps for the, a couple of days yeah. and what we, the way we did it is put a, a ratchet strap round through that window through that window to here and a block and tackle and just lift it up on a block and tackle move yeah. it backwards and lift it back down so right. it's not not that hard to do. Water tanks very quickly the water tanks are on either side of the keel so there's one of the big bladder tanks and there's another one under this side and there is a third one if you want to do it in the forepeak under the, the very front of the nose. I'm not a big fan of water tanks in the forepeak because I don't like keeping weight that far forward mm. but this is 300 litres, that's 300 litres and the one in the forepeak is 300 litres so with all three you'll have 900 litres of water. <laughs> what I would like to do when this boat comes to going in the water is I'd like to seal this all up, bolt it up, get the keel back in and have the, not put the mast up because once the mast is up it sits on there and, th and it, there's nothing you can do if there's a problem. So I would actually like to bolt this all up solid, launch the boat for a weekend and just have it sitting in the water, particularly in dickies, yeah. because it's tidal. So even if there's a drip, it's not going to sink the boat because it's only going to be dripping for yeah, 12 yeah. hours and then you can be, you know, it's yeah, low yeah. tide again. You wouldn't even necessarily have to lift the boat back out to put the mast up. They could just crane the mast up on a low tide have this sat on the on the bottom on the floor and put the mast up with the boat in the water but put the boat in the water first if you need to do anything like take that lid off again and seal it again you haven't got to take the mast off again to do it yeah so that's yeah. the way i would do it launch her first and then make sure that the keel box is sealed because once you've got once you've got the mast on you're not you're not doing anything with that box right engine we can't start the engine sadly so the engine is a ford lehman 80 horsepower four cylinder four liter engine and she runs beautifully she looks in good nick yeah we've done a lot we've done a lot we've had her in bits paul and chris who are both marine engineers have fettled and fiddled with her diesel tank here that's one and another one there and we reckon each of those is close to 500 litres. There's a sight glass on the side of the tank. That tank's full isn't it? Yeah. You can, you see, you can see. Oh uh, so that's the level. That's, that's, the, level. that's, that's the, the level, that's the level yeah. And they're right. balanced. So this pipe joins the two. Ah uh, okay. So yeah, the two yeah. tanks are balanced. So you've got a thousand quid's worth of diesel. <laughs> <laughs> if you buy this boat yeah. and scrap it you've got a thousand pounds worth of diesel. Yeah. Um, anyway I'm just being silly. She's had uh, all of the fuel system has been flushed. Uh, she's had new filters. That's all been bled. There wasn't any water or any signs of diesel bug at all. And the reason there was no signs of diesel bug is because the tanks were left full. Yeah. You can only get diesel bug growing in the layer between water and diesel. Um, you only get water in your diesel if you've left room for it. If you leave your tanks full to the brim, mm. then there's no room for any condensation to form water. So the fact that they were left full has saved them. And when we when we drain the tanks down, you just you literally just put a pot under that and drain the drain that down. Yeah. There was no water in the tank. That, and I say no water. There was maybe an egg cup full of water, and then it was just yeah. sweet diesel. The diesel is red diesel that's in the tank, and it's a very deep red colour. So when you drain it, don't be surprised if it looks black. Right. But it's just got a lot of dye in it. So yeah, you get your strainer. You strain it. So the way that we've run the engine on the hard is we've sh closed the seacock at the bottom. Put, put the hose straight in the top and then you can run the engine. And you notice the way the skin fittings are on this. The ones in the heads are the same. They're a standpipe bolted to the floor with a rubber gasket and some, and some sealant. But then the actual valve and all the rest of the assembly is above the water line. So that you can take this off and rod out anything that gets stuck in it because the water line is uh, is here. Good you for taking through the canals. Oh yeah, 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 that's it, yeah, yeah. You can rod all of that green weed out, just stick a, uh, leave the top off that. Yeah. <laughs> or you can just stick a, stick a piece of bamboo down. This is the heat exchanger that sits on top of the engine and it sits uh, right over the top of the alternator, which is all brand new, and over the top of all your pulleys. So to get access to them, you have to do this kind of, bit of, bit of yoga, and you've got to kind of get down here which is not too difficult and get in here to get access to your belts. I'll let you get in there in a bit and have yeah. a look. That heat exchanger was a bit gummed up and a bit corroded and I've had it rebuilt by a marine engineer who said it's fine and it's usable 
and in his recommendation it could probably do with replacing at some point. So what we've actually done on his advice is we've bought a, a second hand but newer unit and we've actually bought a remote heat exchanger. The principle being that we're going to mount it, I don't know, on these brackets or somewhere else off to one side and just take a pipe through the heat exchanger and back. It, it just cleans everything up and it means you can get to the belts on your alternator belt and your water pump a lot easier. That there is your calorifier which has got an immersion unit on it as well. You can heat it from the mains. You can also heat it from the Ebers battery which is tucked away under there or you can heat it from a pipe. This, you take this pipe off here through that and then back through into the engine um, and it would heat the water in, the, in that calorifier. If you've got twin doubled up short flow pumps for the pressurized water. All right, so obviously, you know, I'm looking around at loads of different options, different boats, different types of boats. You've told me that you've got a, a nice offer. <laughs> yeah. But, so it would be interesting to talk, talk money. Cards on the table. We, we don't want to make any profit out of selling this boat if we sell it to Mark. So we paid £2,000 for the boat. We've spent about uh, £8,000 on welding by a professional welder, Danny, who came and did the welding on the keel and the patches in the aft end. Uh, and we've probably spent a grand or more on paint and the rest and then the steel itself and then various other bits and pieces, running rigging and stuff like that. And it all adds up. Uh, mm. We're not interested in making a profit if we're selling to Mark. So I'm offering the boat to Mark for £15,000, uh, which is 10000 less than what I would want if I was selling it, fit, you know, in the water. Mm. Um, my preferred way of doing this would be for us to get the boat in the water um, by Easter and to sell the boat for more money um, to get 25, but in the water floating with the rig up, the engine working, steering working. But if Mark wants to buy the boat sooner than that, then I would say 15 and on top of that 15, we will be massively involved in uh, at very least a, a telling Mark how, how to put it all back together because we took it apart. Mm -hmm. And ideally I'd be here when, when we put the keel back in, when we put the mast up, when we do the last little bits of welding and to help with painting and, and you know, and. Once the boat's floating and running with a good engine, good steering, you know, at least working engine, working steering, working rig, not sinking, and it can be, you know, Mark can then take it wherever he wants to go with it. So there you go, 15 grand, uh, and on that, we are breaking even, more-ish, we're probably making a loss actually on that. Certainly yeah. we're not making any profit at all, but that's fine. Yeah, definitely an interesting. Which is a lot of boat for 15 grand. Yes. Yeah, yeah, like there's a lot of, and it's, in terms of space, it's, I mean, she's a 30, it's 35, 30, but 36, John Teal 36, 36. yeah, but massive for a 36 foot boat. Yeah, like when you compare this to the Freedom that I looked at, there's a lot, a lot more, well, there's a lot more volume, but there's a lot more interior space. Mm -hmm. The deck, obviously you've not got your mast up, but it feels uh, like there's a lot more space there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like, like I've said, Probably annoying for a lot of people, and hopefully not for you as well. But like, no, no, don't worry. Like, it's such an interesting option. And the reason we've done this video, guys, is because there's so many people on our channel who said, "Oh, you've got to get in touch with Mark." And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, we have. We talk on a regular <laughs> basis. We're good mates." Yeah. And people on Mark's channel saying, "You've got to get in touch with Andy. They say they're going to be selling selling the steel pilot house." So we're doing the video um, uh, because by popular demand. Yeah. But it is also a very interesting, we'd love the boat to go to Mark because mm. we then see her continue on a really popular YouTube channel with an awesome guy going off and doing what we intended her to do. And the mm. only reason we're not doing it on this boat is because she's going to be too small for a family of four. Mm. If Melissa hadn't fallen pregnant, we'd be going on this boat, no shadow of a doubt. Mm. I'm complete confidence in this boat. Um, yeah. But she's a steel boat and steel boats rust and need a lot of looking after. Mark's aware of that, I think, so. Yeah, I, that's the thing, like, it's daunting for me to be thinking about a steel boat just because it's a completely new set of skills, welding and that sort of thing. So that's another thing I need to take into account as well. But like, you, your initial reaction to that, it's like, ah, oh, you know. You, you shouldn't you, need to do any welding. All the big welding will be done. Yeah. Um, you might, you'll need to do uh, maintenance, so chipping hammer, needle gun, bit of grinding and, and get used to keeping on top. And if you keep on top yeah, of the maintenance, yeah. you shouldn't need to do any welding. 
for at least 10 years or, or more, 30 hopefully. Yeah. And, um, you know, and even myself, I'm a decent fabricator. I've refabricated the whole cockpit and I've done the whole chain locker. But when it came to the bits below the waterline, I backed down and just paid somebody else to do those bits because it's just not worth the risk, is it? So, yeah, yeah. But the lovely thing about steel is anything that goes wrong, you can just cut it out and have it welded back on, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's just so strong. Yeah. But I'm not trying to talk Mark into this. That's <laughs> the last thing that I want to do. Yeah, and we said from the start, you're not trying to really, you know, you're not so, trying to oversell it. No. Um, there you go, 15,000 quid. And realistically, I can, if I had a, a month and was in a month of good weather and good health, we could get this boat in the water easily in a month. Mm. Um, uh, in all probability, it's probably more like two or three months because we're fitting it around other things. Yeah. But um, our plan, regardless of Mark's intentions, is to get the boat in the water by Easter and on the market. Yeah, yeah. There's a spoiler for you. <laughs> yeah. Easter eggs. Well, there you go. Just a massive thanks to Andy uh, and Melissa and Jack as well. So I stayed at their place that evening. And uh, yeah, these guys, they're juggling so much at the moment. Andy's a paramedic. Melissa's pregnant with their baby. They've got two boats on the go. So yeah, I don't know how they find time to be doing all these projects and making videos. So thank you so much to those guys. I bet a lot of people are wondering if now I'm just wasting time and not getting to you know to making a decision on the boat however i'm not 100 percent on any boat that i've seen yet i know the freedom 35 was a close one this melody is an interesting prospect but i am i'm constantly looking um i've uploaded a video to patreon and coffee a bit more like this one i'm just gonna talk about all the boats that i'm looking at and all that stuff but i'm not gonna buy a boat that i'm not 100 percent on so with the Freedom 35, you know, most of the comments on that video were buy it, buy it, buy it, don't wait, waste any time, go sailing. But in my heart, I'm not 100% sold on it. Like I said, I have plans for potentially a slightly larger boat, maybe more of a project. Uh, it just depends. I don't want to get a project that's, that's going to cost me more in the long run. Anyway, more information on that on my coffee and Patreon, just to say thank you to you guys who uh, have been there, took that little extra step to help me. But yeah, you guys who are watching these videos and subscribing, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. And yeah, thank you so much. See you in the next video. Really appreciate you watching. And yeah, thanks a lot. See ya.